All right, good morning to Calvary Baptist Church attendees today. We're glad you're here. If you can't tell that we didn't have a blast, then you are sadly wrong. We had so much fun this past week, so much fun that we're going to ask the kids to come up here this morning and share one of the songs that they learned with you. So kids, come on up. Adults that are going to dance with children, come on up. If you're an adult that just wants to dance, you may come on up, and they will teach you this on the spot. There's a kangaroo, platypus, dingo, emu, koala up a tree. Wombat, numbat, cricket bat, red back, so many critters to see. Bandicoot, lorikeet, kookaburra, ha ha, brain coral living in the sea. Flying fox, there's a croc, clownfish, the most wonderfully made is me. Wonderfully made, I'm so wonderfully made. Different than a wombat. What a great guy. just talking about another branch on the family tree. We're talking about a different tree. Uh, we're talking about trees. Thought we're talking about animals. Uh, animal trees. Just sing the song, mate. A bit faster this time. There's a kangaroo, platypus, dingo, the new koala up a tree. Wombat, numbat, cricket bat, red back, so many critters to see. Bandicoot, lorikeet, kookaburra, ha-ha, brain coral living in the sea. Flying fox, there's a crop, clownfish, the most wonderfully made is me. Wonderfully made, I'm so wonderfully made. Different than a wombat. What a great god, I'm so wonderfully made. Different than a dingo. Oh, yeah. We're made different. For example, have you ever heard a camel try and sing? No, but birds can sing. Fair point. Very repetitive lyrics, though. Let's try it faster. There's a kangaroo, platypus, dingo, the new koala up a tree. Wombat, numbat, cricket bat, red back, so many critters to see. Bandicoot, lorikeet, kookaburra, ha ha, brain coral living in the sea. Flying fox, there's a rock clown, fish, the most wonderfully made is me. Wonderfully made. So how many of y'all want to learn that dance? <laughs> I decided for a gift for all of our VBS workers, they will be getting a small cream of that muscle-soothing stuff <laughs> because at the end of it, you are worn slam out. I didn't personally participate in this. I did wear a koala outfit for a week. So we had so much fun. We're glad that you're here this morning and you could come and worship with us and just get to see a very small part of why we do VBS and why it's important to take time out of our year for a week and just pour into these students uh, is such a great blessing to get to do that. Uh, I want to remind you, we do have Pastor Bobby's retirement party coming up, so please make plans to be here for that. Uh, a lot of years of wonderful, faithful service, and we want to make sure we celebrate that and that we make sure we wrap our arms around uh, Miss Patty, who has been there side by side the entire time and arguably the harder of the two jobs because she's taking care of everybody. So please be here for that. That's such a big deal, and we want to make sure we honor that well. We also, before we continue into our service, want to take a moment to think about what's coming up this week. We do have the SBC convention, and for those of you that have kind of kept up, there's been some things going on, some particularly horrific things, and we want to put that in prayer. There's a lot of people that have hurt because of choices by pastors and lay leaders and deacons, and while that's a painful, horrible thing, we are called to pray for that, to make sure that we remember the victim, that we lift them up, and that we pray for God's will to be revealed in that situation and that we would see healing there. 
So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you for a day that we get to worship you. Lord, may we never make light of that day. Father, we pray that as an, our convention that we're associated with, as they're dealing with some hard things right now, I pray that they keep their eyes focused on you and that they truly have the movement of the Spirit in their life and that they make no allowance for any wicked that's been done. But Lord, your correction will be brought upon anyone who is the offender and that, Lord, your mercy be reminded within each of those that suffered as victims. Lord, we pray that you would bring just a swift justice there for anyone that needs to be on the receiving end of that. And that, God, that your love would just truly surround all of those that have suffered mightily. We thank you for the opportunity to get to worship you via our tithes and offerings. That we're able to come before you with a gift that we may see your kingdom work done. Lord, may we be ever pressing forward to move into that kingdom work. May it be on our hearts and mind at all times. May we offer blessings to you. May we offer everything that we have to you, Father. And we pray that you would help us to be focused on what it is to truly serve you. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. At this time, Pastor Stewart's going to come up. And I would ask that anyone that's going on the Bristol missions trip come right up front here. And y'all are, Pastor Stewart's going to give us a commissioning and a prayer over those of us that leave tomorrow to go serve in Bristol. Amen. Uh, this is a, a youth trip to Bristol, uh, Virginia, which uh, I don't know if y'all dip down into Tennessee or not, but nope, um, SBC bless one half, you bless whole, the whole, yeah, um, they may not want us in, in North Carolina, I mean, in uh, Tennessee, but um, they, did, they went there last year and uh, they do a lot of uh, community projects and in doing that, they get to meet uh, people in the community, uh, whether they work for uh, public schools or, or the city uh, and then just people walking up and down the street. And, uh, and we have the Great Commission in the Bible. We, we read it. We talk about it a lot. But these guys are going to do it. And I want to remind you of what it says. It says that, uh, go, um, and Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. And behold, I'm with you always to the end of the age. And in there we have the authority to go. Jesus said, all authority is his. And since we belong to him, he tells us what to do. And since he's the authority, we obey. And these guys are examples to this church of obedience to go. But they're not going to paint and to clean up yards. They're doing that, but that's not the purpose. The purpose is, able, is to allow them, give them an opportunity to talk to people about what it means to be a Christ follower, to do his will. And so it says to make disciples of all the nations, to bring people into belief of Christ and to, to know him and to become a follower of his, baptizing them uh, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, which is bringing them into the body of Christ, which is seen visibly and locally in a, in a church like this, but uh, into a, a body of believers, and then teaching them to observe everything he commanded, which means to do what you got discipled about and baptized into, you do that for the rest of your life, which cycles back that those people now go and find people and share Christ with them and teach them. And so these guys have been being discipled by Pastor Stephen, their parents, this church, and other ways. And uh, they are willing to go and to serve Christ in this way. So would you stand with me? Uh, if you're by somebody who doesn't mind, you can hold their hand or touch each other just as a way of connecting. Um, if they do mind, just reach a hand out towards them um, and, uh, and, let, and let us pray for these, uh, these guys. If you're, if you're on the council or deacon, if you want to come down uh, quickly as I begin to pray, come on down and uh, pray over these guys. Father God, in the name of Jesus, uh, we, we cannot go in any other name. We cannot go in the name of Calvary or the SBCV. Uh, we, even though we sponsor this, we help this. But God, we go in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, who's the only one who has authority in heaven and on earth. And as they go and they share the name of Christ, 
uh, with, uh, with people that they don't even know who they are yet. But they're going to have that opportunity to meet them and to speak to them. They're going to speak to each other on this trip and edify one another and exhort one another and encourage one another to love and to good works. Now, God, that as they fulfill that scripture amongst themselves, may it be evident to the people that see them that there, there may be an attraction uh, to, for, of those that you're calling to come and speak to them and, and that they would notice people in need and, and maybe they can make that connection before that person ever comes. And that in those conversations that they could lift up the Lord Jesus Christ, that the Holy Spirit might be able to do what only he can do, what we cannot do. And that is draw people to you, that they would be believers, that they would become disciples, that they would want to to know you and to be in the family of God together. Thank you, Lord, for these young people who are an example to all of us. And may we follow not only in the footsteps of Christ, but as they follow in the footsteps of Christ, Lord, may we, may we also follow with them. May we pray for them this whole week. There's dangers. There's, there's difficulties. Lord, just being with each other for a whole week, they can get on each other's nerves. And I pray, God, that in Jesus' name that you would bring peace and harmony and, and uh, Lord, forgiveness and just learning to work together uh, as a body of Christ. So, Lord, we send them out with our prayers, with our encouragement, with our support, with the love of God, the love of this church on them. Lord, be with the leaders that go with them. Help them as they shepherd these um, young people. But Lord, um, uh, these young people uh, are old enough to take responsibility on themselves. And I just thank you that they are shouldering that. And they're going to work hard and they're going to do your will every day. May they seek you in everything they do. May they do everything they do unto the glory of God. And, is it, and, and to do it as if it, it is for you because it is for you. And so if it's pulling weeds or painting a, 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 a wall, may they do it as if they are doing it to please you. And God, that you would give them the grace to do that. But Lord, as they do that, may they always have in mind the person that needs to hear from them about who you are. And so give them those opportunities as well. We know that you've already set up divine appointments. And may they recognize them when they come. And God, be with them. Bless them. May they know your protection and your presence. And may it be an overwhelming presence. In the name of Jesus, we ask. Amen. God bless you guys.
just to you, Lord, turn His grace for you.
Lord, indeed, it is so comforting to know that you are before us, you are behind us, beside us, you are for us. And Lord, the implications of that are huge. So much of our world wants to deceive us and say that God will get you. And Lord, you, you are perfect justice. You never shrink back from that. But, oh, Lord, you provided a way that we can be just, we can be purified, and that is in the sacrifice of your son, Jesus. So we thank you, Lord, for being just, for being holy, and allowing us into your family through Jesus. And to that we say, alleluia, alleluia, alleluia. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Help us to hear from you now, Lord. May your spirit have his way. In Jesus' name, amen. Sorry. Yeah, I'm on. Okay. Uh, thank you all uh, for being here. Uh, Pastor Stephen uh, did a great job uh, with Bible school. Last week we were in the park, and that was awesome. It's time for Church for Kids. If you're a kid or you have a kid and you want them to go to Church for Kids, uh, not, that's not goats, that's small humans, uh, you, they can uh, be dismissed. Man, that's most everybody was in here, it looks like. So... Um, that was a big VBS crowd. We had so much fun at VBS, we didn't want to give up our t-shirts. So we, uh, we're wearing them today. Um, and on the back, if you didn't notice, it just says event. And uh, that was the thought of Pastor Stephen. He, he, he ordered them that way. And somebody said, well, why don't you make it VBS event or whatever? Well, no, we can wear them for any event. And when we went to the, to the park last week at Montgomery Hall, he, got, he said he got out of the truck and within 30 seconds, a guy was walking by going to the tennis court and said, what kind of event y'all having? And uh, so he got a chance to, to talk to him. So um, the, these shirts mean something today. Um, if it bothers you, the pastor's wearing a t-shirt. I just recommend you repent. That's what we're going to talk about today. Um, so uh, <laughs> I'm just teasing with you guys. So don't, don't get mad. Uh, uh, just The Bible just says be modest and if I'm covered, I'm modest. So that's good. Um, I, I do want us to have a very serious moment here because, uh, and the sermon is very serious because it's talking about repentance. We're moving into that subject. And I'll talk about that more later after I say this. And that is, um, Pastor Stephen, that's what I really started to say, did a, did a fine job praying. Our Southern Baptist Convention is beginning to meet right now. Um, in this past week, they've been in Anaheim, California. And by they, I mean all the messengers from the churches that could go and, and other leaders of our denomination. And they've been doing uh, different kinds of evangelism and block parties and um, the concerts and anything they could do in order to try to share the gospel with the people. If you're not aware of where Anaheim is, it's, the, it's uh, where uh, Disneyland, yeah, Disneyland is, which, uh, I'm, anyway, they'll stop. Um, but be careful about that, parents. And, and, but anyway, it's right next to L.A. and the, L.A., California. And, and so we want to have that gospel witness. But if you didn't keep up with the news a few weeks ago, it hit the news really big. And now it seems to have gone quiet. But it's not going to be quiet within our denomination. That there were leaders and pastors and others in the church that did very heinous things, crimes. And those crimes were covered up instead of being dealt with. And so we pray for the victims of those crimes, and that's the main focus of our prayer. But for many years, the Southern Baptist Convention as a whole, the pastors in there, knew that there was a problem of some sort because we knew that God was not moving amongst us as he has in the past. And hopefully this will be a, a catalyst to cause true repentance within our convention. Now, we can't, we can't be those, uh, you know, Fans of like a sports team that says, we won and they lost. You know, when, when your favorite team loses, you tend to say they lost. And when they win, they say, we won. You want to be a part of a winning team. But if we are associated with them, that means that in, in a special voluntary way, even though we're brothers and sisters to all Christians, we have united with these in particular. And so we are a part of everything that went wrong. And we need to repent as well as the convention as a whole. And we can't say, oh good, I hope they repent. No, we 
also have to do that. And so I want to lead us in a prayer of repentance. The actual convention doesn't start till Tuesday morning. They'll be preaching tonight and all day tomorrow. And I pray that tonight and tomorrow as those pastors go, we call it the pastor's conference or used to. And as they hear sermon after sermon, I pray those speakers will bring the word of God and that God, the Holy Spirit, will move in the convention. Um, I'm encouraged uh, because uh, this isn't a new problem as far as us needing repentance. Um, the, the, the great old preacher who's now with the Lord, Vance Havner, said back in the 1960s that the New Testament said that the Holy Spirit came with a rushing mighty wind. He said, now we just have air conditioning and we think that's God and it's not. And, uh, and, and so we, we need to pray that God will move, not in a new way, but in the way he's always moved and lead us to true repentance. And so I'm going to pray for that. And, uh, and you can join me in prayer and I pray that you would. Uh, if you're not part of, of the body of Christ or you're not part of uh, Southern Baptist uh, Church or Convention, I, I get that. But pray for us, please. If you need to know Christ, I recommend him to you. He loves you and wants you to be a part of the family. So uh, while we pray for this, maybe you want to pray to, to ask him to be uh, your Lord and Savior so that you can be part of the family too. But would you pray with us? Lord God, um, uh, as Isaiah said, he said, I'm a man of unclean lips. I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. And Lord, uh, uh, we as an individual uh, have to pray like that. We as a church need to pray like that. And we as a denomination, we're, the denomination's not uh, biblically ordained by God. It's just part of, of a way we've organized ourselves. But God, we are an association of churches. And as a whole, we have, we have experienced some pain and, and we have experienced actual crimes. We've We've experienced violence uh, toward innocence and, and uh, weakness, uh, people that would be weaker than, than the perpetrators. And uh, Lord, we've abused authority and, and those things and then covered it up or tried to cover it up. But you said there's nothing done in secret that won't be shouted from housetops. And so, Lord, it has been shouted from the housetop. And Lord, if nothing else has ever moved us physically, may, this, may the Holy Spirit use this physical revelation uh, to, to bring repentance to the convention. Uh, Lord, I pray that we would, uh, we asked for this. We asked to be known what, what the problems were. And now that we know them, Lord, may we react correctly. Um, Lord, that we would all break and be bowed before you. That God, our hearts would be broken because of uh, the sin, all the sins that, that we have committed, allowed to be committed. And that God, each of us as individual people, will, will seek your will for our life. And know that, uh, Lord, that we need uh, to repent daily as well. We need to, to repent of our sin of the past. And, and Lord, every day we need to wake up with a repentant attitude that we want to follow you. We, wa we don't want to step outside of your will. We want to do what you call us to. So I pray for our leadership in, in our greater convention. I pray for the pastors that have gathered. I know many, 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 many godly men are there that want to see you work in a new and real way. And God, I pray that you would bring true, a spirit of revival and repentance um, to that gathering there in California. Even today, as they uh, will probably be cranking up really soon, they were going to churches um, they're a few hours behind us, so I know that uh, some of them are just getting to church this morning and then t this afternoon, tonight, they'll be hearing other preaching and pastors uh, bringing your word. And I pray, God, that those words would, would be the words of God and they would drive home and the Holy Spirit would be able to use them in the lives of the men and women who hear that and all the messengers from our churches. God, bring us to the place you want us to be that you could use us. Lord, you don't need us. Uh, we need you. Uh, you can use anybody, you can use anything to accomplish your will. And Lord, we're just selfish enough to want, to want you to use us, but you can't use us if we're not listening and obeying and repenting. So God, I pray right now that you would help Calvary to be a part of that, that you would bring revival here, bring revival into our hearts. Lord, as the one preacher said, the, the way to see revival is draw a chalk circle on the, on the floor and kneel in there and ask God to let revival fall within that circle. And when it falls there, revival has come. God, may we each individually call out for revival in our hearts and lives. And then as a whole, Lord, for our church and as for our denomination, Lord, that we might be a witness in these last days to this nation and to this world. 
that, uh, that this is what a, a, a true believer does when confronted with sin and problems, Lord. We repent with, with true repentance before you and that we rise up to do your will because you're a God that will enable us to do that even out of coming out of our brokenness and our pain. In fact, you can use that more than you can use our haughtiness, our pride, our programs, and our, our uh, professionalism. Lord, you, a broken and contrite spirit, you will not despise. <clears throat> so, Lord, may in our humility we seek your face, and we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Please, this week, you can watch it live on, uh, online. Uh, you can just look up sbc.com, I think. And you can watch that if you will. You can be opening your Bibles to Genesis 42. I, I, I'm going to try to quickly explain that. Um, as, you know how like when you're driving home from a long trip, you get closer to home and you want to kind of speed up. Uh, you're in more danger of speeding up. One time I told Janice that most uh, accidents and, and speeding tickets happen within 10 miles of your home. And she said, well, that's a sign you ought to move. But um, anyhow, uh, I like the way she thinks sometimes. But um, but uh, you know that tendency, and, and, and so I'm getting to the end of Genesis. That's it's 50 chapters, a long book. And we've done it week by week and didn't do a whole chapter each week, so we've been at this a while. I don't even know exactly. Pastor Andy probably does because he, he helps me with that. But, but I, I wanted to speed up, but this thing that is happening at the end of Genesis is painting a picture of our relationship with Christ and what he does. And we're going to see a need of repentance. We're going to see a need of forgiveness and a need of restoration. And we're going to see those, all those things leading to chapter 50. And it is the beginning of God uh, uh, doing something in a nation, or a, a family that becomes a nation, the, the Jewish people, so that we can have a Messiah. And Joseph is a type of Jesus, that Messiah, even in, in all of these stories. And so uh, I want us to see that very clearly. And so I'm calling this a heart of repentance. And we won't get to full repentance today. Um, uh, in, in, in fact, I was having that discussion with, with Janice about that. She said, but you didn't get to the full repentance. I, said, I know, but we're, we're going to get there because it's coming in stages. And so I can't do it all in one. In fact, I'm going to have to skip over more than I want to. Um, it's a long story. It's complicated. And we think we know it, but I want to pull out a few of the things. And hopefully um, that will help us uh, as, we, as we go through it to, to see some of those things. And so here's what I want you to take home with you. That a person of repentance has a love for God and a love for his brothers. Uh, Jesus was asked, and it's in Matthew 22, Jesus was asked by the, the law keepers of his day, the Pharisees and those who kept the law, what is the greatest commandment in the scripture? And the Jewish people have an answer for that. And they were, I don't know what they thought he was going to say because he claimed to be a rabbi, but he said what they thought he should say. But boy, then he brought it home to them in a way they didn't like. And what he did say, the greatest commandment is love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, and all your strength. And that's our emotions, uh, that is our intellect, that is our body. We ought to honor God and, and love God with everything we've got, with our entire being. But the part they didn't like, he said, but the second is like it. That's number one, but number two, love your neighbor as yourself. Because these people didn't love their neighbors. They certainly didn't love the Romans who were keeping them under oppression. They certainly didn't love them. They didn't love the strangers who didn't quite believe like they did. They didn't love the Samaritans who were part Jewish, but they weren't real Jews because they weren't full Jews. And they were condemning all these people around them. And they didn't love Jesus because he took away the cloak of their sin. And, and so when he said that, in another uh, scripture, they said, well, who's our neighbor? And he tells a story of the, the good Samaritan who takes care of the guy who's, who's been set upon by robbers. And so we see that, that a person of God loves God and he loves his brothers. He loves others. And here, Joseph, as a type of Christ, is drawing out from his ten brothers who cast him into slavery. He's drawing out of them a acknowledgement of sin and a repentance. And we want to see that so that it, it might help us. And it's a long passage. It begins actually in chapter 46. We didn't talk about the end of that the last time we were here. And so I just want you to see that God did put Joseph in charge. Now I want you to get the timeline. He was sold into slavery when he's 17. When he gets out of prison, he's 30. 
All right? It was 13 years between his brothers selling him to the slave traders till they sold him to Potiphar, till he went to prison, until Pharaoh takes him out and makes him the second in the kingdom. So now he's 30 years old. And then this passage goes very quickly in these years. He tells Pharaoh his dream, seven years of plenty followed by seven years of famine. And in chapter 46, in verse 50, before the year of famine came, two sons are born to Joseph. And the verses before that tell how Joseph became the leader and he's taken over in, in Egypt. Two sons were born. Uh, Asenath, the daughter of Potiphar, a priest of On, bore them to him. Verse 20, uh, 51, Joseph called the name of the firstborn Manasseh, for he said, God has made me forget all my hardship and all my father's house. It means forgetful uh, or forget. And so, does Joseph not remember? Of course he remembers it but but he means it like don't worry about it. It, 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 it he's forgotten meaning I don't count it as important anymore I'm just forgetting about it, it it's okay because God is in control and he, and he names that boy Manasseh and he also means God has blessed me so much why would I keep whining about what used to be I, I, I'm always fascinated with people that talk about what they don't have and they're not, not looking at what they do have and then the second son, it says uh, in, down in uh, verse 52, the name of the second he called Ephraim because God has made me fruitful in the land of my affliction. So now that I forget the suffering, now God has given me blessing. And so he acknowledges God even as a ruler. And I want you to think about that with Joseph. From the time he was in the pit with his brothers till he goes to Potiphar's house, he begins to honor God in everything he says and does. As he begins this journey after he's been humiliated, like Jesus was coming to earth and humbled himself and took on the form of a man. From then on, everything he does, he gives God glory and glorifies God. In Potiphar's house, he goes to prison. He will not sin against God. In prison, he serves the Lord. He knows God's in charge. But he's there 13 years before he gets out. And now, as we come to today, we're coming to the end of seven years of plenty, going into seven years of absolute famine. And so in verse 53, the seven, so now he's at least 37. The seven years of plenty occurred in the land. They came to an end and the seven years of famine began to come as Joseph had said. And there was famine in all lands, but in all the land of Egypt there was bread because he had put away the grain in every city in Egypt. They had stored up enough grain to last the next seven years. And so it says in 55, And when all the land of Egypt was famished, the people cried to Pharaoh for bread. And Pharaoh said to the Egyptians, Go to Joseph and what he says to you, do that. And Joseph sells the grain to his own people. He sells the grain to the Egyptians. They open it up and he sells it to the Egyptians. By the end of this famine, the government will own all the land and all the food. Don't know what to say about that. Just telling you that's the way it worked. But moreover, all the earth came to Egypt to Joseph to buy grain because famine was over all the earth. So it sets the scene. Joseph is at least 37, maybe 38 or 9 by now before his brothers show up. And he's in charge of feeding the world. And that brings us to the 10 brothers. So look there at verse 1 and 42. And it's something kind of weird to see there. When Jacob learned that there was grain for sale in Egypt, he said to his sons, why do you look at one another? Now, I would, I would point out, remember when Joseph was 17, he had to go spy on his brothers. Why? Because they would slack off. They wouldn't do the work they were supposed to be doing. And now Jacob's looking at his 10 boys go, why are you standing around looking at each other? There's food in Egypt. Go down there and get some. It's like, do you need me to slap you? What, what's going on, you know? It's, it's interesting. This same thing happens on, the, uh, on, on Mount Olive when Jesus was ascended into heaven. The, all the guys, as he ascended up, obviously they're just going, you know, looking up. And the angel shows up and says, why are you standing here looking up into heaven? Get back where he told you to go. Do what he told you to do. It, it, it's sort of those moments that we just get paralyzed. Uh, I, I, it, it's like, uh, it's called being, getting stalled in the door where, where you get there, but then you don't want to go through it. You don't, you don't want to get in, in, into where you're going. And, and these guys are just 
not doing what God wanted to do. So Joseph had been in the driver's seat. He's in a place of authority in order to handle this. And what we're going to see here is that he's going to test these brothers when they get there. And so it's a place of testing. And so in verse 2 there... Um, he said, I heard there's grain for sale in Egypt. Go down there and buy grain for us that we might live and not die. And so 10 of Joseph's brothers went. Now, the Bible wants you to understand that because Benjamin, the baby, stays behind. Benjamin is Joseph's little brother. He's the 12th son. He is a full-blooded brother to Joseph. The only two children born to Rachel, whom Jacob loved, but he did not love uh, her sister, who gave all the other children so he stays behind with dad. And it says, uh, and the Bible tells that, verse 4, Jacob didn't send Benjamin, Joseph's brother, with his brother, for he feared harm might happen to him. And the sons of Israel came to buy among the others who came, for the famine was in the land of Canaan. Now, if you've ever heard this story and it's just cursory uh, reading of it, you just kind of know about it, there, there's some detail there I want to make you think about as we look at it. They didn't show up by themselves. There's a crowd of people from around the world there to buy grain. So I'm sure it's a little chaotic, it's noisy, and it's crowded. And these guys are just jostling in amongst all these people, just so you can kind of understand it. And so look at verse 6. Joseph is governor over the whole land. Well, we already knew that, but the Bible's making a point so we understand he's in a place of absolute authority. What happened to Joseph back before? He was sold into slavery. He was humbled and became came to slavery. This is like Christ in Philippians. Where the Bible says he humbled himself and took on the form of a man. And even to the point of being a servant to us. And being found and fashioned as a servant, he became obedient even to death on the cross. And so, as Joseph is humbled as Christ was, he is now serving but now he's been given this place of authority. The Bible says, but because Jesus did that, he was exalted, given a name above every name, that the name of Jesus, every knee would bow and every tongue confess, right? And so we're going to see a picture of that in Joseph's life. And so he was the one who sold all the people of the land. And Joseph's brothers came in, verse 6, and bowed themselves before him with their faces to the ground. Ever heard that before? Joseph saw his brothers and recognized them but he treated them like strangers and spoke roughly to them. Look down at verse 8. Joseph recognized them, but they did not recognize him. And verse 9 says, and Joseph remembered the dreams he had dreamed of them. He remembers back when he was 15 or 16 that he had that dream that that would happen. I, I just point out that God's will will be done. Joseph didn't say, bow before me. Remember that dream? Now get on your knees because I'm not going to feed you if you don't. He didn't have to do anything. All he had to do was obey God and God fulfilled what God was going to do. All he had to do was do what was right and God took care of it. And these brothers bow down before him. But notice back, back up to verse 7 that Joseph begins testing them. Now, again, the Bible has to speak broadly. It doesn't give us all the details all the time. When it does, we ought to pay attention. But even in this, giving us a lot of detail, doesn't give us all of it. I wonder, was Joseph kind of expecting them to show up eventually? Was he kind of looking for them? And if he was, was he doing what most men do? And most men do something. You ladies may or may not realize your husband or guys do this. We battle plan. We battle plan constantly. We walk into a room, we know how to get out of it. We see a stranger, we evaluate. Am I going to, is this a dangerous situation or is it just a regular person? We're always watching, we're always looking. God made boys and men to be observers, to be watchers, to be looking out for those around us, to be shepherds and protectors. And so I, I, I just assume because Joseph's such a man that he thought about, what if my brothers show up? How am I going to act? I don't think this takes him fully by surprise, but it may take him somewhat by surprise. Verse 6 goes, he recognized like, whoa, those are my brothers. But notice what he says he does. He didn't go, guys, it's me. <laughs> I think that what we see as we, this story goes over the next several chapters, and we're only going to look at one chapter and maybe not all of that because I'm already almost out of time, is that 
Joseph wants to see something in his brothers before he lets them know who he is. He wants to know, are they truly repentant? Because if he says, hey, I'm Joseph, they're going to say, I'm sorry, real quick, because he's in charge of all the food, right? He has a place of power now. He could punish them. In fact, even after Jacob dies, years later, they are still afraid Joseph's going to punish them for what they did to him when he has totally forgiven them. Isn't that like us in Christ? Christ totally forgives us. And we're still afraid he hasn't. But he has. His forgiveness is absolute and full. The Bible says in Hebrews, the blood of bulls and goats is not sufficient to cleanse our conscience. But the blood of Christ is. That even though we were sinners, now we're made new creations. And he cleanses us. He cleanses our conscience. So the Bible says in verse 7 that he spoke roughly to them. Where do you come from? What are you doing here? <laughs> it's kind of, kind of funny what he, what he says. They said, we came from the land of Canaan to buy food. And then the Bible says that Joseph recognized them. And, and I just want to put this in your brain. Joseph does it, never lets them know until he reveals himself to them that he knows what they're saying. He always used an interpreter to talk to them so they would not know that he understood when they spoke. He let the interpreter tell him what they said in Egyptian, whatever, however that sounded. But he already knew what they said. And that plays into this chapter a little later on. And so, uh, and so he looks at him and says, no, you're just spies. You just came to see how messed up our land is. That we're not growing food either. And Egypt's weak now. You think we're weak and that you're just spies coming out to, to do something to us. And here's what they say in verse 10. No, my Lord, your servants have come to buy food. We are all sons of one man. We are honest men. <laughs> your servants had never been spies. No, but we had a brother who used to spy on us, but we never were spies. We're honest guys, even though we threw our brother into a pit and sold him into slavery and told daddy he was dead. But we're honest men. You see, Joseph wants to know, has your heart changed? Has it really changed? And so he gives them a test. He said, no, you came to see the nakedness. And without reading it in, in, in verses 12 through, uh, through 17, what he says is on the life of Pharaoh, on, on his name, in the name of Pharaoh, you are spies and here's how I'm going to test you. You shall not go from this place unless the youngest brother comes here. In verse uh, 15. Because what they said is we, we do have two other brothers. The youngest one's back home with daddy. But we had a brother but he is no more. They think Joseph's dead. But the one who is no more is standing in front of them. Jesus is no more, right? They killed him, put him in a tomb. But then he appeared. And he appeared to 500 brothers at once, to the apostles. Appeared to a bunch of people. You see, you can't say he's no more. He's alive forever. And the one who's no more stands in front of them and they bow before him without realizing what they're doing. At the name of Jesus, every knee. I know it says shall bow, so we always put that into the future. I'm telling you right now, demonic forces have to bow at the name of Jesus. It is the power of God for us. And he says, you send one of them back. Send one of your brothers to, and I'm going to keep nine of you. And you send one guy back to bring Benjamin. Then he puts them in jail. They, and we can't do that. No, no, our dad, will, he's not going to let him. All right, go to jail. Let them stew on it for three days. Now they're softened up a little bit. And so he gets them out of jail uh, in verse uh, 18. And on the third day, three days later, huh? He gives them a hint and they miss it. Do this and you will live for I fear God. Now an Egyptian doesn't fear Jehovah. An Egyptian fears Ra and Osiris and Isis and all the demonic gods of the pagan world which are still being worshipped today by the way. There's still that spiritual reality going on and it's growing in our world because as it was in the days of Noah, so it's going to be in the days when Jesus returns. And they were worshiping these same gods. But Joseph says, no, I fear God. They should have gone, wait a minute. Why does an Egyptian prince fear God? Our God, the one we serve. But it just right over their head. But the hint was laid there for them. 
He said, no, no, you're spies. And so I'll tell you what, I'll let nine of you go and I'll keep one of you. So he keeps one brother back. And so he, uh, and, and he keeps, I believe it's uh, Simeon back. And, but I want you to look down as Joseph tells him what he's going to do. You go and you bring your youngest brother to me. Look at verse 28. And Reuben answered the brothers. I'm sorry, let me back that up. In verse 21, they said to one another, In truth, we are guilty concerning our brother, and that we saw the distress of his soul, and he begged us, and we didn't listen. His soul was in distress. Wasn't Jesus' soul in distress in the Garden of Eden? Father, if there's any other way, let's cut past for me. But he had to go through the suffering. And these boys are feeling guilty about selling their brother into slavery. Just as Judas felt guilty for selling Jesus to the Romans, and Peter felt guilty for denying Christ. And they say, we heard the distress of his soul, and we wouldn't listen, and now this is why we're in trouble. And Reuben says in verse 22, didn't I tell you not to sin against the boy, but you wouldn't listen to me? You know, bringing up the past. Now there comes a reckoning for his blood. Now we're going to pay for this. And they did not know Joseph understood them. And this is where it becomes, I want you to see this. And he turned away from them and wept. Joseph hears their, okay, they're catching on. They realize what they did to me. And that they, at least now they're acknowledged it amongst themselves. And so he goes away and he cries, gets himself together. He comes back in, verse 24, uh, and, and then 25. And he returned to them and spoke to them. And he took S Simeon from them and bound him before their eyes. And he told the other ones, you go back to your dad. And you bring your little brother. And if you don't bring him back, I'm going to know you're liars. He's falsely accusing them just as he was falsely accused. Jesus was falsely accused because of our sin. And he comes back to us and says, that wasn't on me, that was on you. And I did that for you. I was sacrificed for you. And so the Bible says they loaded their donkeys and the story is and Joseph put the money in their sack and they stopped someplace and one of the brothers opens the sack to feed his donkey. And, Whoa, the money's there. Oh no, what is going on? We are really going to be condemned now. Isn't it funny that Joseph's being generous to them and they think it's evil? The Bible says in Romans that the kindness and the goodness of God brings us to repentance. Listen, when God does something, you go, oh, whoa, God, we back up. Whatever you're going through, God is putting that in your life to bring you to him, not away from him. And when they see the money, they immediately think, oh, no, we're going to be judged for stealing the money and we didn't steal it. I don't even, we don't even know how it got there. They get home to their dad. They say, dad, the money was put back in our sack. We don't know what happened. And he's like, oh, great. Now we're really in trouble. You can't even go back now. But of course they have to go back and they got to humble themselves. Here's our money back. And he said, I'll keep it. I didn't want you to give it to me anyway. God is being kind. Joseph is being kind to them to show us in Christ's kindness Listen, if you're suffering right now, if there's trouble in your life or if there's good in your life, it's God working to bring you to him. If you won't listen to his kind instruction and you belong to him, he will discipline you with harsh discipline to bring you to him. So let his goodness to you bring you to him. They should have said, wow, he gave us our money back. I don't know why he would do that. Let's go back and ask him, who are you? Why would you be nice to us? But instead, they run away from Joseph instead of toward him. And look at verses 35 and following, just so you see Jacob's mindset. He's afraid for that youngest son. And they envied their sack. Behold, every man's bundle of money is in the sack. And when they and their father saw the bundles of money, they were afraid. And Jacob, their father, said to them, you've bereaved me of my children. This is odd the way he puts this. He's got two sons in his mind. And these ten have go are going to cost him both their sons. Both of his sons. You have bereaved me of my children. Joseph is no more. Simeon is no more. And now you would take Benjamin. All this has come against me. And Reuben, unbeknownst to Joseph, shows love for his brother. He says... Kill my two sons if I don't bring him back to you. Put him in my hands and I'll bring him back to you. Reuben says, I will take the punishment. I will make sure. Now, I don't think he expected 
to have his sons killed. He does, that's not what he's saying. What he's saying is, I'm going to take care of this. And I'm going to give a, a, a reason for... I know I may have goofed off before, but I'm not goofing off now. Because I'm going to put serious consequences of what I'm going to do. I'm going to take care. And so he is showing love for his brothers. Joseph ain't going to know about that till later. But he said, nope. Jacob says, nope, my son won't go down with you. Because his brother is dead and he is the only one left. I thought you had 10 other boys. Not in Jacob's mind. I just got two sons, Joseph and Benjamin. Isn't that odd? It's so odd. And if harm should happen to him in journey, it would bring down my gray head with sorrow to Sheol. Joseph, that's his only full-blooded brother is Benjamin. He wants to see Benjamin. He wants to bless him. Are you afraid to give your best to God? If I dedicate my children to the Lord, he may call them to go to a foreign place, a place different from here, a dangerous place. I got news for you. You live in a dangerous place. There's no hiding place in this world. We face danger every day. There's spiritual wickedness all around us. Our souls are in danger and our physical life sometimes are in danger. And I don't know about you, but I'd rather die in the center of God's will than live outside of it. Because you can't live outside of God's will, not really. You'll just be miserable. And it's better to give all to God than to claim ownership of something you like so much. All these sons belong to God. Jacob should be accounting all of them and not wanting to sacrifice any. But he's willing to leave Simeon in jail just so Benjamin doesn't die. He prefers one son over the other. Listen, if we're going to give all to God, we've got to give all to God. And we can't hold anything back. And I've, I, I, I would suggest that you might want to give everything you have to God, all your children, to his will. I think that ought to be in our church. I think it ought to worry us if we don't have young people dedicating to give their life to follow God. I don't like the dichotomy of saying missionary and something else because we're all supposed to be missionaries. I understand why we use the term. It means we're doing something outside of our normal culture. But every believer is a missionary to all the world or should be. But I do understand that there are specific people that go to specific places and they surrender family and fortune and all opportunity in order to follow God's will. And those people are heroes to me. I, I just got to confess, I love missionaries and what they've done. But it ought to bother us if our church is not producing such young people. I'm not saying we're not. But it ought to bother us if we don't ever see that. Because we ought to be training up adults that want to go and serve God. We ought to be training up children who want to serve God. And our kids won't if we don't. I'm not saying any of us are perfect. We're not. But if we're not willing to serve God wholly, then how will our children ever do that? Our example matters. I've just told you a story today. I, I haven't made very specific points other than to show you how this sort of works out in our life. But Joseph is looking for repentance in these young men. And I began this service by praying for our Southern Baptist Convention. Now, I hate using denominational labels because they don't matter. They burn off in hell and they fall off in heaven. But we have, we have associated ourselves with that particular denomination and, and we need to repent. But that begins in my heart. That begins in your heart. Where in your life do you need to repent? Where is the last time you repented? Who do you hold a grudge against? Who do you have anger toward? Who are you bitter against? Where are you disobeying God? Nobody sees you as you watch that Netflix show or that you look at that thing on your smartphone 
that you shouldn't see. You're setting worthless things before your eyes. When's the last time you said, God, I'm wholly yours? Every part of me, with all my heart, with all my mind, with all my strength. Body, soul, spirit. You see, it is time to repent. It's time for all of us to repent. And our life should show the evidence of repentance. If we're repentant people, we will love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, and strength. And we will love our neighbors as we love ourselves. And notice there's a vertical and a horizontal. We love God and we love our neighbors. It makes a cross. And that is what God calls us to. That is discipleship. That we hang, we, we take up, Jesus said, you can't be my disciple unless you take up your cross. And a cross is not an instrument of torture. It's an instrument of death. God doesn't call us to be better. He calls us to be dead to ourselves and alive to him. And that cross is the symbol of our death and of his life in us. Because he rose from the dead. Just this morning, I read a devotion every day uh, put out by Dr. Chuck Lawless. He, uh, he went with our guys to Israel. I've been following him on, on his devotion for many years. And just today, he ended it because it was about repentance. Imagine that. And he put a prayer at the end, and this is what he said. Here would be a prayer. God, show me my heart as it truly is, and let my repentance be real and lasting. And so I'm going to ask us to pray right now and ask God, ask you to ask God, show me my heart as it really is. Am I wholly devoted to you or am I keeping a part back for me? And God, lead me to repentance that is real and it lasts a lifetime. I want you to pray with me. Just close your eyes. I'm going to ask everybody, well, you can stay seated for now. But I'm going to ask you to stand up in a minute. But right now, in your heart, would you just pray, not out loud, Lord, show me my heart as it truly is. Lord, when you showed Isaiah, he cried out, woe is me, I'm undone. I'm a man of unclean lips. I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord God in glory. Lord, may we see you as you are. Lord, show us our sin, but Lord, show us because we see you in perfection and holiness. And I'm going to ask us all just to stand right now. And Pastor Andy's going to come and play for us a, a bit. Thank you, Pastor Andy. We're not going to sing. Our heads are bowed. Our eyes are closed. Nobody's looking around. I'm going to ask that if you're willing, Jesus said to a, a man who needed his son delivered from a demon, if you believe, it is possible. And the man said, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. You may not feel repentant, but you want to know what repentance feels like. That is a work of God in us. We can't get there on our own. We need God to do that. And if you're willing to say to God, show me my heart as truly as lead me to repentance. Nobody's looking around. You're going to have to open your eyes to get down here, but just come stand around here. But once you get here, close your eyes again. Because it doesn't matter who comes or doesn't come. It matters what's going on in your heart. You may do that at your seat. But boy, what an encouragement if we all together cry out to God, each individually, that God would show us our heart. Lord, I pray that for me. And I'll pray it out loud so that others may hear and be encouraged. God, show me my heart. Show me the wickedness in my heart. Show me the sin in my heart. As the psalmist said, show me my secret sins. Lord, things that I don't even know is sin before you. And Lord, I, I ask for myself mainly and, and really only, but I, I do pray for Calvary Baptist Church that if as, as a church, if we have sin, that you would show it to us. Lord, if, if we are not doing something we ought to do or if we're doing something we shouldn't do, that God, we would see that clearly and that we would be obedient. But God, Right now, we're praying for ourselves. We're praying for those we're a part of, not for ourselves, but for your glory, that we might be clean vessels before you, that we might be a true witness, 
Lord, that we would be an example to other believers and we would be an encouragement and a help to other people, that you would give us the heart of Christ. You said you give us the mind of Christ, but Lord, we know that you also give us your heart, your desires. You, you said in the Psalms that when we seek you, you give us the desires of our heart. Not that you give us what we want, but you get, put your desires in our heart. And so, Lord, as we see Joseph testing his brothers to bring them to a place of understanding and repentance. So we ask, Lord, as you test us, that we would understand what you're saying. As we look in your word, we would know your will for our hearts, our minds, our lives. And Lord, we just start where you started. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind and strength and, and to love our neighbors ourself. The, this is what it boils down to. There's nothing else but those two things. So Lord, show us where we don't love you with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our mind, with all our strength. Show us, Lord, that we walk past the homeless. We walk past the broken. We walk past the hurting without ever pausing to give them the grace of God. So, Lord, as we leave this place today, open our eyes like you've never done it before. May we be led to repentance like we've never repented before. And, Lord, we ask, we're asking that you might be gracious and generous to us. Lord, our individual lives, we don't have much time left. Lord, I understood that as a young man, and now I'm, I'm much, much older. I can't be called young anymore. And yet, Lord, not only am I running out of time, but this world is running out of time. And there are billions of people that don't even have the opportunity to hear the name of Jesus. We want to preach our government. We want to preach our pleasure. We want to preach our programs and professionalism, but we don't preach Jesus. Lord, forgive us. And may we bring the grace of God into the lives of people who need you so desperately. Lord, indeed, we dedicate our children to you, that you would use them, Lord, any way you see fit in order to bring the glory of God to all the world. That starts here and now with us. Lord, show us if there's someone we need to be right with, if there's a sin we need to confess right now that we immediately begin in our hearts right now before you, saying, Lord, this is sin. I turn away from it. I want you. I want your grace, your abundance, your strength in my life. For there's no way we can do that on our own. We have to have you, Lord. We need your Holy Spirit to open our eyes. We need your Holy Spirit to convict us of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment to come. We need you, Holy Spirit, to move amongst us. And Lord, we don't know how to ask except to ask. And we don't know how you're going to do it except we believe that you will do it. And so, Lord, as we leave this place, we leave humbled in humility and in knowledge of desperate need. For your grace. Thank you that you give that freely. You don't upbraid us for needing it. Rather you just give it to us and help us. And so Lord as we ask. We believe that the answer is coming. In Jesus name. Amen. God bless you. Go with God. Pastor Stephen forgot to tell you. That the party is the last Sunday in this month. At 5 o'clock here. Okay. For Pastor Bobby. We're going to have that party. 5 o'clock last Sunday in June.